Hello everybody, my name is Dr Jane Warren and I'm from Australia. And I'd like to welcome you to this session this afternoon that's looking at how to support the sensory needs of your child. So I'm just going to um, start the sharing of the screen. So what we're going to do this afternoon is go through um, a series of um, different slides and I'm going to discuss some different things and then um, we'll come to some questions at the end. In Australia, we start our presentations with an acknowledgement to our country, which recognises the traditional custodians of our land. So I'd just like to start with that. I'd like to acknowledge the original custodians of our land the Wadi Wadi people of the Darul Nation, which is where I'm presenting from today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the great work of the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority, who've made this um, initiative a reality for us all to enjoy. So as I said, I'm going to present for approximately 30 minutes. And during that time, if questions arise for you, if you could put those questions into the chat space, then it means that I could come back later on to have a look at those questions in the chat space. In the final 20 minutes, um, there will be an opportunity as well for you um, to uh, raise your hand and ask a question if you would like to. So we can, you can either put the question into the chat space or I can answer the question um, if you'd like to ask it. If you can hold your questions though until the end of the presentation or just put them into the chat space as we go, um, that would be preferable because as I'm going through the presentation, there may be things that arise for you and hopefully I'll be answering those questions during the presentation. If I don't answer them, then I'll get to them um, at the end. So I'm just going to um, refer to my other screen here and I just wanna start by talking a little bit about our senses in general. And really the reason for that is because if we can talk a little bit about um, our senses and what our senses um, do for us in general, it helps us to recognise the things that maybe children then are going to have some difficulty with. So the senses that we're focusing on, um, traditionally I guess there's five senses that we talk about, which is sight, sound, touch, taste and smell. So they're the five senses that everybody is sort of familiar with. But there's actually two other senses that are very important and these might be particularly important for your children. So these, um, these senses are the sense that's around our balance, which is called our vestibular sense. And then the other one is around our body awareness, which is called proprioception. So there is a handout and I just need to locate that handout on, um, my screen because when I open them up um, they actually all overlap so it's very difficult for me to see which one I'm trying to access for you. So there is, um, you may already have these handouts available to you, if not they are available there and you just need to um, be able to access them. So, sorry this is just jammed underneath. So I'm just going to um, move this up onto the share screen now so that you can have a little look at this one. Um, but as I said, it is one of your, um, your handouts that's available to you. So this is really just reinforcing the information that I said around our five, um, five original senses and the two that are also very important for children who have sensory um, difficulties. So we have um, the key sensory um, areas and they're listed here as I just explained. And then you'll notice that after that, I've just gone through and given you a description um, of what that particular sense involves. So our sight um, is in relation to our visual sense. Um, our hearing is our auditory sense. Touch is tactile, and it's also sometimes referred to as somatosensory, um, and that's the receptors within our skin. So that we often think about touch being through our fingers, but it's also obviously through the remainder of our skin, so um, throughout the whole body. The olfactory sense is where we talk about um, smell. Gustatory is around taste. Our vestibular, around the balance and the movement, and gravity fits into that as well. 
And proprioception is where we're thinking about our movement, um, the movement of our own body parts, but also how we move um, in space. So um, our spatial awareness and things like that. So that's one of the handouts that um, you can refer to. Now, um, some of you may have children who are on the autism spectrum. If you'd just like to pop into the chat space, whether you do have a child that's on the autism spectrum or not. So you can just do that by, um, by saying yes or no into the space there. And um, I guess the thing to think about in relation to um, children with sensory issues is that not um, every child with sensory issues does have a diagnosis of autism um, and not every child with autism is going to have um, sensory issues. But you will find that a lot of children on the autism spectrum do have sensory issues and a lot of other children do as well. So this presentation isn't just restricted to um, children on the autism spectrum. You will find though a lot of the information does refer to children with autism. But if your child doesn't have autism, don't let that make you think this isn't suitable for you. So you might have heard of um, people being oversensitive or undersensitive. And what we call those is when we're oversensitive to things, it's being hypersensitive. And when we're undersensitive, it's hyposensitive. So some children might have hypersensitivities in one area, but might have hyposensitivities in another area. They might have overlapping um, areas of sensory need, or they might just have a particular focus on one area of need in relation to their senses. So we're going to explore this a lot more throughout this, um, this afternoon's presentation. To start with, we need to acknowledge the fact that we all have different sensitivities. And these pictures that are on the screen are just for you to have a look at and think about the kind of sensitivities that you yourself may experience. And they aren't deemed as being hyper or hyposensitivities. They're just sensory needs that we all have. But it helps us to think about the fact that how we feel when our sensory needs aren't being met. So if we just have a look, for example, the pictures in the middle and one lady is very rugged up and one lady is using a fan to try to cool herself down. Now you may find that um, obviously the outdoor temperature does make a difference to how you feel, but then some people are much more, um, much more impacted by cold weather and they get much colder and other people get uh, quite warm. So they hardly ever, put jumpers on even when there's cold weather. The other thing is in the pictures there, like somebody might have very sensitive teeth or might be quite sensitive to light. Um, there's also around pain. So somebody might be quite overwhelmed by, um, by lots of noise. So that lady um, who looks like she has a headache, she may have that headache because of, there's lots of noise happening and it's making her um, head hurt, but it also might be that she's more sensitive to that sort of thing. Some people will be very sensitive to noises, for example, um, fingernails down a chalkboard or um, the sound of rubber, like someone rubbing a balloon with their hands, or somebody might um, find that they have sensitive issues. So when somebody starts talking about a spider, for example, and I know in Australia we have quite a few spiders, um, but sometimes people will actually get a physical reaction on their skin when they just hear about a spider. So there are all the kinds of sensitivities that people might have, and they're still not classed as having any kind of sensory issues, but they're just for us to think about the dif difficulties and sometimes the differences that we all have around our sensory issues. I just want to touch on sensory processing disorder because you may have heard that terminology but we're not actually talking about sensory processing disorder as such in here. There's a link at the bottom of this slide you can see. And if you would like to get a little bit more information about sensory processing disorder, this little YouTube video um, explores sensory processing disorder from a child's perspective. Um, so it goes through a whole lot of different sensory issues that that child may have. Now, sensory processing disorder is a quite um, contested diagnosis. So sensory processing disorder does not, um, does not fit into one of the disorders that is part of the, the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, 
it doesn't fit into there. And so some people will talk about sensory processing disorder and some people dismiss it and say there's no such thing. So I'm just letting you know that if you hear about sensory processing disorder, there's not one um, way of fitting into that. Um, it's more just looking at um, every child's sensory issues on their own. But it just helps you to, this kind of terminology, if you come across it, to see that the things they're talking around sensory processing disorder might be things that are relevant to your child. But having a diagnosis of sensory processing disorder will be very dependent on where you live um, and the different people that um, do diagnoses. So what happens is most of the time um, you can monitor your own sensitivities. So in those pictures that I just showed you before, if you know that you're a person that feels the cold, you will look at ways to adapt to that. So you might um, have a hot water bottle or you might um, have hot drinks or there's things that you will do to help yourself when you have those kinds of sensitivities. What happens though is that children who have... Um, quite significant sensitivities around their senses will actually need some support in doing this. So it's not something they can necessarily manage on their own. And that's where we really need to think about for your own children. And um, in my role, because I was an early childhood teacher, I need to think about um, how, how I can support children around their senses and what we can do to make the world an easier place for children with sensory sensitivities. So we're going to have a look at a very short clip and this clip is from the UK and it is um, a child who has autism. But I just want you to watch this and then we're going to just have a little bit of a discussion about um, whether any of this might apply to your own child. So when you're watching this, think about if you've ever been in situations like this. So I'm going to unshare my screen now and then this little clip will play. I'm autistic and I just get too much information. Okay, I'm just going to go back to sharing the screen. Um, I just realised in the chat space there was a message from one of the organisers who has mentioned that you couldn't see that handout previously. Um, please don't be bothered by that. We'll return to the handouts at the end. But that handout I referred to before was just going through definitions around the, um, the key sensory areas that I mentioned. So I'm just going to go back to sharing, um, to sharing my PowerPoint screen. Sorry, I don't know why that just jumped into my presentation again. I'm not sure whether you can actually see my presentation. Um, it's doing something strange um, on my screen. So I'm hoping that you can just see it as a presentation. 
Um, maybe one of the organisers could let me know, but I can't actually see the, the messages um, in that chat either when I'm sharing my screen, unfortunately. Um, so I'll just have to persist as I am at the moment. So we're going to talk a little bit about hyper and hyposensitivity. And I'm just going to refer you again to one of the, um, one of the handouts um, that actually does talk about these um, hyper and hyposensitivities. So I'll just quickly um, show this to you. Sorry, the PowerPoint um, is obviously in the way of this. My computer seems to be doing some very strange things. I might come back to these handouts towards the end. So this, um, this information that's on the screen at the moment um, is actually um, the stuff that is on your handouts. So um, I will show you these handouts um, when I've concluded the presentation. So what I'm doing in these next few slides is really going through um, some of the um, different areas in the senses and then looking at what hyposensitivity might look like and what hypersensitivity might look like. Now, from that little clip that we just watched, um, if you can just put into the chat space whether you have had any experience with your child having any kind of reaction like that boy did when you're out in public or when you found that there's a lot of sense information that's being given to the child. So you could see in that one that he was obviously quite sensitive to noise and to light. And he actually had a strategy where he counted on his hand and calmed himself down. His mum also said to him, hold my hand. So that was obviously a strategy they'd worked out together that was supporting him. But then what happened was when the television screens all came on and there was too much information at once, what then happened was he became very overwhelmed and then it appears like he has difficult behaviours when it's actually his response to that sensory stimuli. So if you can pop in the chat space, if you've ever had a situation where your child has been overwhelmed by any kind of sensory input, you could just say yes or no. So on this slide here, and I'm not going to go through every one of these areas because this information is there on a handout for you to refer to later on. But we might just look at um, one section in each area. So if we think about sight, a child that's hypersensitive, so they're oversensitive to sound, to, to light and to things to do with their vision, will find that, um, that bright lights and things actually, um, they appear to jump around. They actually are much more bright and um, are maybe a little bit of offensive even for some people. Um, the images may jump and be fragmented. Um, and some, a child might um, find that it's easier to focus on um, something little rather than the whole object. So the child might focus on just one little part of it and hold it up very close, not because they actually need that extra visual information, but because they can't look at the whole picture. The whole picture is very difficult. Somebody who is oversensitive to, um, in, in their vision as well, you might find that they find it difficult to look at your face. Um, they, because the face has a lot of information, so they might tend to look away from people. If we think about hearing, and we'll go to the undersensitive this time, so we'll look at the hyposensitivity, and they might find that they don't actually hear different sounds. So they don't actually have a hearing, um, a hearing deficit, but their brain's not giving them the information around the sound that's coming in. Um, they might actually love places where there's lots of noise, because they can hear more information and it's supporting them. So they're seeking more sensory information, whereas the people in the hypersensitivity will be trying to get rid of that information. So I'll just go um, on to the next one, which will focus a little bit on um, touch and taste. So somebody in relation to touch, you might find that um, if we think about the children who are oversensitive to touch, they might find it very difficult to have their shoes off because the feet, if there's too much um, sensory information going in their feet, they might find that even the different texture of clothing is offensive to them and it makes them really uncomfortable. So a new jumper, for example, against their skin 
might make them really, really uncomfortable and it might um, actually contribute to challenging behaviour. Uh, touch can be quite painful. So even a small touch can feel like someone's hitting them with a hammer. So it can, their skin is very, very sensitive to touch. Um, a child who has an undersensitivity to taste might really like things that have lots and lots of taste, so very spicy things. But they also might seek to put anything in their mouth and taste it. So they might actually eat non-food items as well. So they might um, want to pick the plaster out of a wall or they want to eat the grass um, because those things are actually giving them um, more information in relation to their taste. On the other hand, you can see there that the children who are oversensitive might only eat certain textures. So your child might know only like soft food or they only like crunchy thing like uncooked pasta. They won't eat stuff when it's soft. So those children have an oversensitivity in relation to their taste. Um, in relation to smell, again, over or under sensitive, they will be seeking more smells if they're under sensitive and they'll be quite overwhelmed by smells if they're oversensitive to it. Now, in relation to our balance, our vestibular sense, um, children who are under sensitive have a need to be moving. So they might need to be in a swing or they might need to, um, to have things where they're moving. So they spin around a lot. Um, so they need that constant movement. Um, but children who are oversensitive find any movements um, quite overwhelming. So they might be more prone to getting car sick or they have, um, if, if they were, um, someone did put them on a swing, it would be like um, maybe one of us going on a roller coaster at a theme park that we didn't like. Um, so it's very, very overwhelming for them. And in relation to our proprioceptive sense, um, if children are undersensitive, they might um, they might try to get closer to people. They might bump into other people or to things because they can't navigate their space. Um, for children who are oversensitive, though, they might find they actually need to use their whole body um, to help them to look at things. Even so, they they're really having to um, having to use their body. Um, in a different way to what we do. So I want you to think for a minute about your own child. And um, I have a hand out there that's around the sensory needs um, of your own child and how you can use this as a bit of a checklist um, that's going to assist you in looking at your child's sensory needs. But just because my computer seems to be having some um, issues at the moment, I might keep that hand out and go through it when I finish this presentation. This isn't a formal assessment tool, so it's not to determine if your child has significant sensory difficulties. It's for you to be able to help identify which areas your child's having more difficulty with and whether they seem like they're over or under sensitive to things. The reason for that is because once you know that information, it means that you can then adjust things. And there's another handout where it looks at how you can adjust things maybe at home to support your child with sensory difficulties. So we'll have a look at those handouts in a few minutes. I guess the thing to think about is always be really truthful with yourself when you're answering these things. It's not um, an assessment to put your child in a box and say, this is what your child has or doesn't have. It's about looking at how you can best support your child. And the more you understand your child and their sensory needs, the easier it will be for your child, but also the easier it will be for you. So it's important to think about how you can manage your environment and your routines to support your child. So we'll also have a look uh, very shortly at the handout about how to respond to your child's sensory needs at home. Now, I'm not sure um, whether this information is useful for you, but it's, it's often a response to sensory stimuli that causes some children to have what we call meltdowns. Now, um, if children become overwhelmed by things in the environment, and that boy in the clip was a good example, that he started to, he just threw himself on the ground. It's not a tantrum like a child who's not getting their own way. Um, they might choose, a child who's not getting their own way, who doesn't have sensory difficulties, might choose to throw themselves on the floor because they think they'll get attention. A meltdown is not, um, it's not attention seeking. 
it is the child's response to an overwhelming environment. So um, there is a link there just in case you're not very sure about meltdowns and you would like to get some more information um, because it's important to think about the difference between tantrums and meltdowns. So you may have another child who has um, had more tantrum kind of behaviour and so then you're, you're managing it in the same way but it's not as effective and that's because your child now might be having more meltdowns. So it's just that over response to the sensory stimuli in the world. And I'm happy to, if anyone has a question around that, I'm obviously happy to answer that at the end. So if your child does have a meltdown, if they actually throw themselves on the floor because they're overwhelmed by the sensory stimuli, there's a few strategies that you can use that are going to assist you. Of course, the first thing you need to do is make sure that your child is safe. So you always need to check for safety. It's important not to um, be scolding their behaviour because it's not about a controlled, um, a controlled strategy for them. What it is, is them being overwhelmed. So you need to be reassuring, give them some space, and that's space in terms of physical space, but also um, if, if they need you to just be near them but not holding them, then you need to give them that bit of space. If you can remove any of that additional sensory information, that's going to make it easier for them to calm. So for example, um, reducing lights or taking away some of the noise. So if you were in a shopping center like that little clip, you might choose to take your child back out to sit in the quiet car, even if you have to carry them out so that then they can um, start to de-stress. And try to engage with your child as soon as you can afterwards to bring them out of that. Um, but sometimes this is going to be trial and error because you know your individual child and you know what's going to work best for them. Now, the other thing we're going to talk a little bit about um, is about some different sensory, um, sensory ideas. So um, what I would like to do is just go to um, have a look at the handouts now. So I'm going to uh, reduce this PowerPoint We'll have a look at some of the handouts and then I have some practical things that I would also like to show you. Um, so then I will stop sharing the screen afterwards and I'm going to show you some of these kinds of sensory toys. So I'll just reduce this. Oh, there's the other one hiding behind it. I'm sorry about that, that confusion with the um, PowerPoint. So I'm just going to um, show you some of the um, different handouts. So the one I'll start with is this one that I referred to before that unfortunately you couldn't see. So this just has some information here about the seven different senses and it has information about what each one of those senses is. So it just gives you some basic definitions so that you can refer to that um, or to help anyone else um, to understand the different senses if they're not sure. So that just goes through those seven senses. And there's a reference there at the bottom of the different senses, um, the information about the different senses. Um, what I've tried to do with the references that I have used in the presentation um, is to mostly use electronic references so that you can access ad additional information if you would like to. So that handout really is just giving you a little bit of an overview. So the next handout that I would like to um, to talk to you about is this one where I was saying about determining your own child's sensory needs. And this is, um, this is an important um, tool that you can use. There's lots of different versions of this sort of tool, but as I said, this is not a screening tool that is going to um, give you a diagnosis. It's a screening tool to help you to understand your child's senses. So if we have a look here at the information that's on this handout, and I won't go through it all, you can have a look, but basically what you do is have a look in the left-hand column over here and have a look at the kind of age that your child is and then have a look at some of the things that you might like to determine whether they are or are not doing them. So if we just go, for example, through to... Um, a child in, we'll just go to this age group here, um, to the four to five years. 
Um, you may find if your child is older and they're not doing anything in that particular area, you can go back to a younger one and see if they're doing some of the things in there. But you can see that there's things here um, that are around um, more general skills. And there's also things in here that are very much specific to sensory skills, such as um, coping in noisy or busy environments, um, sitting to pay attention, which is a cognitive skill. So it's a thinking skill, but it's also very dependent on the stimuli that's in the environment. So if the environment is too noisy, um, the child might find it very difficult to sit with other children. So sometimes children, for example, on the autism spectrum, will find it difficult to be too close to other people. And that's because um, other people might smell, um, you know, their perfume, um, their shampoo that they use, the washing powder they use for their clothes. Um, they might find that the people are too noisy. Um, so these things are to do with sensory issues as well as other things. Um, clothing that's um, appropriate to the weather um, can be very much around um, their ability to recognise the temperature. So there's a whole lot of different things in here that you could use to have a look through. And I know I mentioned in one of my other um, presentations, something, for example, um, like here, tolerating different clothing um, textures, seams, different tags that are within clothing. A child who is very oversensitive in um, their touch will often find that um, different material is going to be difficult. So if you, for example, find that your child is getting quite distressed every time you go to put particular socks on or particular shorts or underwear or a t-shirt, it may be that the material is different and it's creating an uncomfortable feeling on their skin. So this handout is just to help you to have a look at your own child and to really think about how they might respond to some of those sensory things. So um, this handout here is one that um, talks about the things that we had on that um, on that other um, slide um, that talked about undersensitivity and oversensitivity. So you can see there that there's just the table, just as there was on these um, on the slide, that has about the undersensitive and has about the oversensitive. And it goes through each of those um, senses. So if we just scroll through, you can see that it goes through the touch, it goes through the taste, the smell, the balance and the body awareness. And again, there's a reference at the bottom there if you would like to find out more information. But I think it's important to think about how, how your child is... Um, is responding. So um, we can automatically assume that people take in information the same way that we do. But if we just think about here, um, here the, the child that has an inability to cut out noise. Um, so if you think about maybe when you go somewhere that's very busy and you're talking to somebody that you might be with, um, you can try to block out some of that background noise to be able to focus on the person that's speaking to you. But for a child who has um, oversensitive um, hearing, what will happen is that they, they won't be able to, um, to pick out those sounds. So everything is too noisy. So it's hard to focus on one person who's speaking and all those little noises. And in that little clip, it showed you that, that like coins dropped on the floor or somebody drinking a drink can be very, very noisy for a child who's having difficulty. So that handout can help you to get a little bit of an idea of that. Um, so I'm going to go through now um, some, um, some things about in your home, how you might be able to consider um, thinking about different things in your home and how they might, um, might challenge your child or how they might, um, things that you might be able to adapt and if you can kind of narrow down what it is that is the sensitivities your child has, it means you can look at some of these different areas of the home and think about how you can make changes that will support your child. So if we have a look at this handout here, um, and I've just divided it into some different areas of the home for you to ask yourself some questions. So for example, if we look here in the bathroom, if your child seems to, um, to hate going in the bathroom, doesn't like going to the toilet, won't go to the shower, doesn't like the bath, um, 
it might not be that your child doesn't like those things. What it might be is that your child finds that there's, um, there's lots of different conflicting smells in a bathroom. So there might be um, shampoo, there might be perfume, there might be powder, there might be lotion, and all of those things have different smells. So for you, you can focus in on your favourite smells and some things you might not even notice they have a particular scent. But somebody who's oversensitive will find that very difficult. Um, if we think about areas like the kitchen, if your child is under sensitive, they might be trying to touch the stove top because that the heat, they don't find that too difficult, but they're trying to get that sensory information. Um, another example might be in the um, lounge room that it's too noisy with the television on or people talking. So for your child to feel calm, they may need some headphones um, to block out some sound. Or in the bedroom, they might find that they actually need additional um, information on their skin. So they need, they like firm touch on their skin. So your child might like it if you actually stroke their skin quite um, firmly. And they also might find it difficult to sleep in the bed unless they're tucked in really, really tight. Or there's these things like um, sleep sock things that you can actually um, be in that are more tight around your body or sheet things that children can go underneath so they feel more in a cocoon. So that just gives you some ideas that you can think of at home. In addition, this, um, this handout just talks about some different routines. Um, and there might be things in these routines that you find are very difficult in your household. So I'll just go to the eating meals example here. If you find that meal times are a struggle with your child and it becomes, um, I guess, just a bit of a battle for everybody. Um, your child might get distressed, so they make lots of noise. It disrupts everybody else. Everybody starts to find meal times very stressful. If you ask yourself some of these questions, this might kind of give you an indication of things that you might be able to adapt. So if the table is too noisy with everybody there, maybe it is about having headphones. Um, or everybody in your family maybe needs to use a very, very small voice um, to talk. So you need to think about trialling some things that are going to make it easier. The other thing is that if your child will only eat foods of a certain texture, you can still give them a nutritious diet, but focus on the things that they're comfortable eating. Now, you can also talk to a therapist about how you can introduce other things, but if your child really dislikes the texture of something in their mouth and spits it out all the time at meal times, that becomes distressing for you and the child's not getting nutrition anyway. So I've had an example um, before where a parent was very, very concerned because her child would only eat uncooked pasta. So the child would never eat the pasta when it was cooked. So the mum was really concerned that that can't be good for her child. So I spoke to, um, to somebody who um, was quite an expert in this area. And they said that the thing is, if the pasta, whether it's cooked or not, it's still the pasta. So if the child likes the uncooked pasta, does it really matter? And that's the kind of thing you need to think about um, for yourself and for your family. So that handout just focuses on that. Now I'm just gonna show you quickly this handout and then I'm go I would like to show you a few um, practical examples here of sensory toys, um, sensory things that you can make. Um, and then I can take questions as well. So um, this just goes through some different um, recipes that you might be able to make at home. And I've got some examples of these kinds of things. So some squish bags or there's um, weight, all sorts of of different things here that I've just got that are examples. So you can refer to this handout and these are just things that you can make at home. So some of these are things that I'm going to show you with the actual practical idea in a minute. The other thing is here, I've got some, um, these come from this site at the top here or additional sites that are listed within the handout. And there's just a number of different things here um, that will also be sensory um, sensory toys that you can make for your child. Because if they're seeking, for example, if they um, are under sensitive um, and they're sensory seeking around the visual sense, if you've got things that they can look at closely and things that are bright and things that's going to support them with that, then they might find taking that with them when they go to a new environment gives them some security. 
Um, so I'll show you some examples in a minute. So this handout here just gives you some pictures as well. And as I said, you can see that there's different references here um, that you can have a look at. But I'd like to stop sharing now and actually show you some of these practical things and then I can have a look at the questions as well. So um, I'll just start off by showing you um, some items and then we'll, um, we'll have a little look um, at this. I'm sorry, there seems to be, I, these, um, when I was looking at, um, looking at the, I can't see the chat space when I'm on share screen. So I'm only seeing it now and it appears that there's been some difficulties for you um, seeing the um, PowerPoint. So I really apologize for that, but I can't see the chat space when I'm on um, the share screen. So I'll show you some of these items. So there was one that talked about, um, about making squish kind of items. So this one here is just a balloon and this one here has rice in it, um, but you can put any sorts of things in here. So you just need to use like a funnel um, and you just put the funnel into the balloon and then you put the items in and keep tugging the balloon down to make it. If your child chews things, you need very, very strong balloons. This one's quite a strong balloon. But I don't know if you can hear this sound. It can be useful for children in terms of sound, but also just to be able to keep squishing it. Um, for a child who needs to touch things, this is going to help them. Um, this also is something, as I said, when you're going somewhere where things might be overwhelming, this might be something that they can have in their pocket that they can constantly squish. So that's very easy to make just with a balloon and some rice or some um, something else. So that's just rice inside. Um, there were also talked about different um, things there, um, noise maybe creating ones. So these are just things, um, these are both just little um, containers that I've made. Obviously you could take the um, top down of these. This one here um, has some little pebbles in it as well, colored pebbles that are um, from gardening um, type things. So um, the child can move it around. Um, they might find it's quite soothing watching the rice falling um, and they might like to look for these pebbles in there or they might just like to use it as a shaking to make noise. This one here just has stones that are out of the garden. Um, oh no, this one has pasta in it. So it's just got a few grains of pasta in it. Um, and this one makes a very different sound this one so you can use make these things quite easily for children um, there's also it talked about squish bags in um, one of those and I've just got some examples here of the squish bags that I um, referred to so these are just plastic bags and I have in here corn flour paint and there's a recipe for that on your recipe um, sheet and these you just can squish them around obviously if I was working with children with these I would take the top down so that then it can't come out. If your child is a chewer though, you will find that they will, um, that they will chew this, which um, will mean that they will have paint in their mouth. So um, it's not toxic, but it might, not, um, might make a little bit of a mess. Um, this is just another example. I've got white and red and yellow. And so instead of actually mixing it, then your children would mix it. And you can also see this one's got stones in. So these are the ones, stone, just stones out of the garden, um, but it creates a different feel. And so a child might just like to rub their hands on the stone, but it's all very squishy and feels very nice. There's other ways of doing this. And this is another squish bag with some um, little stones inside. Um, but this one actually is taped onto some cardboard. So this can go on a wall um, or you can put it on the floor and they can stand on it. Um, you can do that with the other squish bags as well. But this one in particular, you can, um, yeah, you can put them onto very hard, um, very hard cardboard and you can cover them. I use these in um, a group that I do with children um, who have sensory challenges and um, they often use these to stand on. So we actually put, um, clear contact paper over them as well. And what that does is that provides some, um, some additional strength in it so that they can't actually break it. Um, so um, we've had children chew on them and um, 
and jump on them and they don't break when they've got the additional contact. But you can just see there um, the, with the stones. Now with these things, um, I'll just take that off there. But um, when you have, um, if you have them on a window as well, I'm not sure you probably can't see and I don't have a window right behind me. I have my window in front of me. But if you put these with the um, on a window, then the light will come through and that creates a whole different visual um, input for the children. You can also just have this one here has um, is just plain. And if I'm just going to use um, some, just some food colouring from the supermarket and just pour a tiny little bit of food colouring in, and then what happens as the children squish this, so you don't actually mix it for them um, and you can just have it so that then the more they squish it, um, the more that that colour will go in through um, all of that um, all of that white and end up just making a, um, a whole blue bag. But it's quite soothing for some children to watch this process of the colour going in there. The last one I just want to show you before I take questions is just to use a bottle with water in it. Um, and then you can just use some um, oil. So this is just um, canola oil, but any kind of vegetable oil. And just put the funnel in so that it doesn't spill everywhere. And um, just put, going to put some oil into the same bottle with the water. And because oil and water don't mix, um, then it can create some different things. So I'll just put a little bit of colouring in um, as well and then show you this bottle. Um, but I'm not sure if you can see here. So the oil is on the top of this bottle. It has a little bit of um, moisture on the outside of the bottle. Um, but the oil is on the top. And it's very difficult for you to see in the computer. But when you put these together, um, you'll actually see there'll be um, oil bubbles inside here. So it creates like a lava lamp kind of look. But it's very difficult for you to see um, to see at the moment. And you can see inside there, I just put something in as a floater. Um, so that's just actually a leaf. Um, but you can put little um, things in there to float around, um, which children can really enjoy. So little fish or whatever. And so then they can watch that. So there's lots of very, very simple things that you can create at home that are going to make, um, give your children that additional sensory information, which might support their um, learning as well. So I'm just going to see if anybody has any questions about any of those things that I have talked about. Um, the um, actual presentation that um, the slides that I went through will be available at the end of um, this conference as well so that the organisers will have those available for you so that then you will be able to, um, to refer to those as well, it's particularly if you weren't able to see them. And I do apologise for that. I'm not quite sure what the issue um, was I think it was maybe to do with something I was doing, um, but I apologise for that. So is there anyone who, um, who does have a question for me, something that um, might be useful for you to find out about? There doesn't appear to be any questions on the chat space at the moment, but if you would like to um, put a question in there, um, or maybe if you would like to, if you would like me to talk a little bit about the um, the difference between meltdowns and tantrums or if there's something else, if you can just pop it into the chat space. Um, otherwise, I will just use the remainder of the time to go back over maybe that section around the meltdowns and tantrums. But you're all very quiet. Nobody's popped anything in the chat space except the organisers, so it's a little bit difficult for me to see if you have any particular questions. So if you do have a question, please put it into the chat space. If you think of a question um, at the conclusion of this, um, but you would like to get some more information, if you can contact the conference organisers and then they will send any questions through to me and then I can, um, I can answer those questions so that response will go back to you. It doesn't appear that there's any questions there, so I might just go um, to the um, meltdowns and tantrums, and I'm just going to um, just going to show you. Um, I won't go on to share screen until I have the um, information there, so that you don't have to um, be looking at all of the confusion that was before. 
So I'm just going to go to the meltdowns um, and show you that information. But I think the important thing to remember is um, that there is a difference between, um, between tantrums and meltdowns. Um, and this is something for us to really consider with children. So I'm just going to, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to go through, um, I'll just quickly go through the difference between um, tantrums and meltdowns on this sheet, um, but I won't go through everything. Um, if these sheets are interesting for you, um, I'm happy for you to, um, to share these as well, but you will need to put it in the chat space if you would like these handouts because they weren't ones that I had originally um, considered um, in here. So I'm just going to share the screen again um, and finish with talking about basically what a sensory meltdown is. So I will just go onto that share screen. So hopefully, um, hopefully you can see um, that, I'm not sure why that other handout's on there. So on here, it just says what a sensory meltdown is. And that's what we need to be thinking about because this is in relation to the fact that your child is feeling very overwhelmed. So um, you can see there that there's an example where it says the commotion of an amusement park um, might set a child off, for example. So someone going to the shops might make it difficult. If you take them to the park, it might be hard. But I, I like this analogy that is listed down here and I'm just going to show you this bit here. I'm not sure how well you can see that. But it says that imagine that you're filling up a water pitcher. So most of the time you can control that flow of water and you can fill it a little bit at a time. But if the water is the water flow is too strong and it overflows the picture, then you're not controlling that. And that's how we need to think about the um, idea of the sensory overload. That what happens is, you know, you're filling this cup or a water pitcher up and you're filling it and you're just controlling that I'm going to have this much and then I'm going to drink a little bit so it's going to go back down here. And I'm going to have up here and then I'm going to drink a little bit. But when you pour that in, it goes into a very, very strong stream. It all overflows. Um, and that's what happens with sensory meltdown. Now, I'll show you the, um, the other one that is around how you might manage, um, how you then might manage a meltdown. So we'll just finish um, focusing on this. And then um, if you have additional information I can um, now I'm not on PowerPoint I can actually see the chat space so please um, let me know if um, you have any additional questions so obviously if you know what triggers your child you can prevent the meltdown in the first place or you can certainly look at um, here where it's talking about um, recognizing the signs of escalation so when it's starting to get overwhelming can you remove your child from that space um, initially so rather than um, it's, I guess it's the idea of preventing rather than curing. So if you can prevent the meltdown happening in the beginning, that's going to be much, much better for your child and for you than having to actually manage the meltdown. Um, the thing is, though, that sometimes you can see that happening and it all happens very, very quickly and it's hard for you to be able to monitor that. So when there is a meltdown, you need to make sure that you're checking for the child's safety. And these are the things that I talked about before. Um, if your child, if you know your child likes pressure on their skin, you might pull them in close. And it's not about restraining them. It's about giving them the comfort that they might get from being held in very close. Or it might be that you have a, a song that you can sing very, very quietly to your child's ear that makes your child feel more calm. So trying to get out of that um, space that's making it difficult for them. Because while you're remaining in there, so the, in that little clip, if the mum remains in that shopping centre, the child is going to be very difficult for the child to come out of that meltdown. So after the meltdown, you need to be thinking about how you can, um, how you can help your child to recover from it. So... Um, they might be quite exhausted because it's very overwhelming. And if you think about any time something's been overwhelming for you, you can't snap straight out of that. Um, so really help your child to look at that. And this will be very dependent on your child's age as to how much discussion you can have. And it will also be dependent on your child's particular skills. So if your child 
um, has sensory issues but doesn't have autism, for example, you can have some discussions. If your child has autism and um, an intellectual delay and sensory issues, then that must be more difficult. So you need to be doing some more controlling around that. So the key takeaways around meltdowns is remembering that a tantrum is something you can ignore and the child can stop, but a meltdown isn't something that the child can stop on their own. You need to look at how to um, stop those things from escalating. Um, so the, um, the other thing... There's still no questions, so I'm assuming nobody's got any particular questions. So I'm just going to um, take that away now that I'm not sh sharing the screen. Um, so the other thing to think about is all of the things that I showed you, you can think about how you can adapt any of these kinds of things to needs of your own child. So if you imagine, for example, that your child um, really likes little things in their hand, so they like to hold something. So that's part of their touch need. So they like to hold real things. Then putting little stones or putting rice and things into these is really useful. There's an example on that handout that talks about um, using hair gel. So um, you, the, you just can buy a tub of very cheap um, gel that you can put into your hair and it will last forever. Whereas this paint, this is made out of corn flour and water. Um, you might call it cornstarch or corn flour but you'll find that this eventually will go mouldy because it's just flour and water. So um, then you need to be thinking about, about how to sustain that. If you want things that are gonna last longer, you need to think about the kinds of things that you can use. So I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions before we finish up for this afternoon. If there's anyone you might like to just pop in the chat space, if it's clear to you, thank you to the person who has indicated that that was all clear despite the challenges around the PowerPoint. So I'm assuming that there isn't anything else that I can help you with this afternoon. So I'm just going to quickly go back onto the, um, the PowerPoint slide um, and just finish the presentation um, with um, just letting you know of another workshop that is coming up that might be um, interesting to you. So it, this will be dependent, of course, on, um, on your child, but I'll just, um, just share the screen one more time and again, I'm not sure why my screen is doing different things when I go onto it. I will just try to, okay. Um, Okay, so um, there's one more workshop that I'm going to be doing in two weeks' time. So um, I'm not sure if it's useful to you and um, finding out some different information. But the last workshop I'm going to be doing is about how you and your other children can play at home and in your community with your child or your children of determination. Um, so I... Um, one of the things that's often quite difficult for parents is um, you might have been used to playing with your other children, but now it's a little bit more difficult knowing how to play with your child. So the last workshop that I'm going to be doing is focusing on um, some practical ways that you can play with your child. So if you're interested in that workshop, please look out for it. So thank you very much for your attention this afternoon, everybody. I hope that there was something out of the presentation that was useful for you. Um, to assist you in understanding how to support your child's sensory needs um, at home. So thank you very much. Good afternoon.